Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Flyly. My name is Joe Beatty. I'm editor in chief of the North Carolina Historical Review, and we're glad to have another conversation this morning with uh, some friends of the Historical Review and of the publications section. So uh, I want to first introduce uh, our friends here. We're joined today by Professor Kenneth Jenkin, who holds an appointment in African, African American and Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. We've seen him recently on the on the Flyleaf. Uh, he's published biographies of Walter White and Rayford Logan, and his most recent work is on the Wilmington 10. We're joined, he's joined today uh, by Dr. Glenn Bowman, who's professor of history at Elizabeth City State University. In honor of the longtime university archivist, Professor Bowman in 2005 established the Leonard Ballou Memorial Fund, which has been tapped to fund student scholarships. He wrote Elizabeth City State University, 1891 to 2016, the continuity of a historical legacy of excellence and resilience in 2016 in honor of the university's 125th anniversary. And in 2017, he received the University of North Carolina Board of Governors Award for Excellence in Teaching. Now today, uh, we're gonna discuss his uh, April 2021 article in the Historical Review titled From Confrontation to Conviction, Student Activism at Elizabeth City State Teachers and State College, 1948 to 1968. Gentlemen, thank you both. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna uh, duck out the back and, uh, and let you two carry on this great conversation. Thanks. Well, Professor Bowman, thank you for uh, being here uh, today to talk about your, uh, your work. Uh, let me set the stage for our conversation um, with a, uh, an, a, a little excerpt from your, uh, from your article. Uh, you wrote, with their distinct combination of youth, enthusiasm, race consciousness, economic and cultural awareness, idealism, and political activism, states supported historically black universities in North Carolina often served as important, if not the most important, incubators of the post-World War II phase of the civil rights movement. While many civil rights era student demonstrations took place in North Carolina's urban areas, some of the fiercest battles were fought from far from cities like Raleigh, Charlotte, and Winston-Salem, in places like Edenton and Elizabeth City, rural areas that have deeper traditions of conservatism and often greater hostility to the ideals of the civil rights movement. Uh, this gets to the heart, I, I think, uh, of the, some of the most important uh, uh, ideas and uh, arguments in your um, in your uh, essay. And uh, so let me take that and then use that. And I have some questions I'd like to ask you uh, about your article. Um, you identify uh, three broad periods of uh, student protest at Elizabeth City State Teachers College. Uh, the first one around 1945 under the uh, presidency of uh, Sidney Williams. And then there is uh, uh, the period of the mid to late 1950s, also under Williams. And the third was the 1960s when Walter uh, Ridley uh, was president. Um, so we're historians and we're always liking to think about change over time as well as continuity. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what distinguishes each of these periods from the other and uh, what, uh, what, if anything, that they share in common, what binds them together? Why, why did you choose to talk about you know, 1948 to 1945 to 1968? Well, I, th I think the, the title of the article from confrontation to conviction is, was, was chosen because to me, it, it shows just the dramatic radical change in the character of the student body uh, prior to World War II. Uh, the reality is that Elizabeth City, even to this day, is different from many of the centers 
of other historically black um, colleges, universities in North Carolina. Uh, there's a history of conservatism. That meant that really historically students uh, did not question what they were told. They did not confront uh, leaders, uh, even if they disagreed with some of their strictness. Many times early uh, leaders were very strict and they had very firm social rules, even including the faculty. Uh, and by the, by the end of the first, by the end of the second world war, the student body was starting to change. Uh, and to me, the first part that addressed, the first part that I address is not to me a point of great pride uh, as an institution. It, it really is something that the students had just had enough and they, they had tired of being told what to do. They had tired of being uh, not allowed to express their positions. They, they were reacting against what they saw as kind of a dictatorial air. And, and to me, the first real true student activism was actually a response by some disgruntled students to a professor who had been hired to help this institution become uh, a highly rated Sachs institution. Uh, the reality is that Elizabeth State did not have a one, did not have a one single professor on the, on the faculty with a doctorate degree. They hired somebody named Raymond Grand Lloyd uh, and, and Lloyd came to campus and the school received its accreditation from Sachs uh, as an A institution. And Lloyd was under the impression that standards were gonna be improved and increased and, and excellence. And he was gonna be tougher on the student body and demand higher work to get higher grades. And some students reacted against that. Uh, during this time, there was a lack of faculty available housing in Lisbon City. And many, if not most faculty lived on the campus. They lived literally in the dorm the, the residence halls with students. Mm -hmm. And the first act of student activism, the first reaction was uh, students who got very angry at Professor Lloyd, uh, confronted him in his residence hall room, and Lloyd got frightened and left campus and left in the middle of the semester. Uh, the, the students, and again, to me, it's not a point of pride because faculty are supposed to make it hard on students. We're supposed to make uh, our, our standards high. Um, but it was the first time that students actually said, no, no, um, this, isn't, this isn't right. Uh, and, and that to me is not the, it, it, I guess to me, the transformation from this 1948 unfortunate episode to really 1960, 1963, it's just revolutionary. The, the change is beyond dramatic to me. Uh, how students started to be demanding their rights as students and as members of the community. Mm -hmm. so. so how does that, okay, so, okay. Uh, can you, you, <laughs> you talk about, no, I'm just trying to think of the continuities yes. there. And so you're, what I'm getting from you is that, yes. uh, you know, in the childhood game, which one is not like the others? Uh, the, the 1948 yes. is is oh different God. because it um, uh, it was it was uh, it, it was not particularly concerned with uh, any uh, social issues, but concerned with issues no. of fairness on on campus uh, and, and, and campus life. Is, it, is that correct? That's true. Well, okay. that's, that's true. And it really, not, not until 1960 that you really see the student body actually leave the campus to undertake the desegregation of their campus's hometown. Uh, the mm -hmm. 1953 uh, incident was the next one. And it was, yes. again, a reaction against the, what students saw as their lack of, of representation, their lack of a chance to weigh in on committees that dealt with students. Uh, the 1953 incident uh, actually led to the creation of the first student government association. It was called at the time the student assembly. The students uh, became frustrated that three of their fellow students who happened to be athletes uh, were accused of something. And it's not as if they supported what the students did. They, they reacted against 
the lack of concern for the students. The students thought that these accused mm -hmm. students deserve some kind of fair process, some kind of due process, and, and they should not be treated like children. They should be treated like adults. Students should have mm -hmm. a say in the discipline of students. And the students decided they were going to go on strike. They did not come to classes, completely shut down the campus, and the administration was aghast by this. How dare the students do this? They're supposed to be in class. So the administration reacted by shutting down the cafeteria, which as anybody who works at university knows that is just uh, something that you won't do to students because students expect that to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. And so th they thought that shutting down the cafeteria would end the student uh, dispute. No, mm -hmm. no, what happened was some supporters of the students actually brought food to the students. And the students demanded changes. They wanted to have sororities and fraternities that they could join. By that point, there had been none on this campus, none. And they wanted that chance to do that. They wanted to have a student government association where they could actually address student matters. They wanted student representation on committees that dealt with student discipline. That's what they wanted. Uh, and the administration it, uh, ultimately caved, uh, ultimately, they, so they caved in, they ultimately did the right thing and granted that. Uh, and, and that started the history of student governance, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that we have to this day. In 2022, uh, the Student Government Association president is actually a member of the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we've come a long way from 1953. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds in some ways, uh, that the vibe in uh, in Elizabeth City was very much like the vibe of uh, of youth rebellion in the United States in the fifties and early sixties. Is that a fair statement? Do you think? Uh, in, in terms of how the community, um, could you could you um, perhaps perhaps mm -hmm. I, I will say this that. Many times the older generation did not understand the younger generation in this regard. There was definitely a major generation gap. You mm -hmm. see this in the press. You see this how uh, the local newspaper, the Daily Advance treated mm -hmm. these incidents. They treated the 1953 incident uh, to me in a condescending way. They also did to me even on a greater scale in 1960 mm -hmm. and 63. And that mm -hmm. uh, I think the older generation had a hard time accepting that times had changed. Students mm -hmm. were going to be demanding more. Uh, and many of the students who were here in the late 40s and 50s had already fought in World War II. Right. And they had already seen the broader world. And I think the older generation had a hard time accepting that mm -hmm. uh, and, and saw these to us to be, to us, we seem to be legitimate uh, requests to be uh, outrageous, mm -hmm. outrageous requests. Uh -huh. So the, the the veterans on campus, I mean, really, they were more, they were more adult than, than, you know, a 17 or 18 year old uh, uh, typical student. I think that that was very interesting. And, you know, we know that, that uh, veterans uh, in the post-World War II era were uh, essential to the awakening of, uh, of, uh, of, of political protest. Uh, so let's, let's move on from, uh, the 19, uh, from the 1940s and early 1950s. And I'd, I'd like to turn our attention to, um, uh, to uh, 1960. And, you know, you note that... Uh, that there were protests at, uh, at Elizabeth City State Teachers College uh, not long after uh, the first protests in, uh, in Greensboro. Uh, I think it was the same month, right? Um, uh, how, uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about these protests? And in particular, I was very interested in your discussion of the position and the role of uh, the president, uh, President Ridley. So can you talk yes. about that some? Yes, absolutely. Uh, president Martin Nathaniel Ridley was a departure from the Williams administration. And I don't mean to disparage President Williams. He, he did fight to, to increase academic offerings and he deserves credit for that among other things. But Walter Ridley was somebody who was to me a, a transformational leader uh, he was the first 
first African American to earn a doctorate, an academic doctorate at a state supported institution that was once part of the Confederacy, University of Virginia uh, and EDD in 1953. Ridley uh, was in a difficult position. Uh, we know, for example, that in, in, 19, in 1960, he was trying to keep the support of the local business community because this was the time before we had Pell Grants, before we had federal financial aid and local businesses donated money to the school to help students. And yet that you have students who, and, and again, this has been substantiated very clearly in the press, um, February 11th, 1960, uh, a small group of students uh, entered the W.T. Grant located on East Main Street. Now, W.T. Grant was like the Walmart of its time, in terms of Elizabeth City, at least. It was like a Woolworths. It was based in New York. Um, now, 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 Ridley, Ridley, unlike some presidents, and if you read um, Jelani Favor's book, uh, Shorter in a Time of Storm, you see the differences between how presidents reacted to student activism. You have David Dallas Jones from Bennett College who was more supportive. Uh, and then, and then, you, then you have uh, other ones like Felton Clark at Southern University who, who kicked out students. Ridley was in a tough position um, as a state supported school in particular. Uh, Ridley definitely to me respected students uh, and, and such. And that, that meant the world of students, especially in 1963. In 1963, he actually was dressed down by a state budget officer, a former Rose Scholar named Hugh Cannon, because Ridley actually allowed state vehicles to be used to transport demonstrators. And you know, that, that was like, wow, this was 1963. But in 1960, uh, Ridley was in a tough position. Now, in terms of the faculty, Let's say this is another uh, subject for debate here is what did the faculty, because we know there were students, it started as a small group, uh, mostly football players, and then it started to, to increase from five to 13 to 50 and such. Uh, but but there's a debate. Um, the basketball coach, the department chair of physical education, they watched um, Robert Lewis Fong. Uh, in, a, in a 1979 interview with the Virginia pilot, he actually says that he was there in 1960. Uh, and I heard him speak about his involvement in 1963 uh, and such. He did not participate in 63, but he was there to supervise and to watch. Uh, but, but the reality is, is that Ridley did not expel students. Ridley did what he could to, to me at least, considering the climate of the time to support student activism in the way he, he could, the best he could, without actually expressly, um, verbally, because again, it was it was in a tough position uh, to be a, a president at at the time. Mm -hmm. Did you have a sense of how he managed that? And that is a that is a tough position, uh, you know, having to, you know, please a business community and a yeah. board of trustees and the students and usually presidents would make a hash of it and not not please anyone but he seemed to be pretty you know pretty popular and you know in all areas how how he managed it that that's yeah. another uh, how he managed it is he i just give an example yes please the uh governor let's say uh, the governor of the time uh Luther Hodges sent letters to all, all colleges, and not just state colleges, but other colleges too, asking the presidents, what are you doing to stop these student demonstrations? Okay, putting them on the spot. Uh, Ridley's letter exhibits the, the nuanced approach that he wasn't, wasn't going on one side or the other. Uh, and you see the differences between how other presidents reacted. Some of them said, we're standing firm against this, we're not allowing this to happen. We know they really didn't even ask for the letter at first. It took a second request for the, the institution to respond. Uh, but I, I would say this, it, it, is that Ridley's support throughout the 1960s, uh, I would say helped help galvanize the community, uh, especially in 1963, because in 1963 was much more of a challenge. In 1960, no students were arrested because W.T. Grant was based in New York and 
W.T. Grant did not have a firm position regarding segregation. They just wanted to make money. Uh, they already had desegregated their Baltimore lunch counters in 1956. Um, mm -hmm. So W.T. Grant did not have any students arrested. In 1963, that was a much more confrontational. That was much more uh, of a legal battle. And during that battle, Ridley stood by his students. Ridley stood by his students' rights. Uh, and arguably the student body to buy them as well. And Ridley, to me, had a strong role because students respected Walter Ridley because Walter Ridley respected them. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you mentioned 1963 demonstrations, you know, about, and you, you mentioned the arrests uh, there. Can yeah. you say a little bit more about the protests and the the fight in the courts, uh, you know, what happened after, after they were arrested? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 1960 started, it was, it was not something that, it started out with just a handful of students. And these students had been in contact with other uh, black colleges in North Carolina, uh, including they were in contact with CORE. In 1963, this was a much, much larger demonstration. Uh, the reality was in 1963, although there had been some improvements, most of the downtown businesses on Main Street were still segregated. Uh, the hotels, the restaurants, uh, mm -hmm. the newsstands, among other things. And the students had been inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King's August 1963, I Have a Dream speech. Some students were actually in Washington, DC, heard that address, and inspired them to go back. They came back in early in the semester, in fall. And you're, you're talking here about not just a five or 15 or 30, you're talking about, you know, more like hundreds of students mm -hmm. went into the central restaurant, went into a newsstand. And now these were businesses and they at the time had the right to not serve customers. Right. And these businesses had chosen that we are not going to serve. Students went in, they, they sat down. This time they were, this time there were arrests. Uh, you're talking here about well over a hundred students were arrested. That's a lot of students because this campus was not anything near the size it is, it is now. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that the students had heard about, students on campus had heard the news. They came, they, after their afternoon classes ended, walked down Southern Avenue, went to the jail and sung songs of support, sung, expressed the support and love they had for them. Uh, and ultimately the, 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 um, the, the uh, local authorities prosecuted only those whom they saw as the ringleaders. Now, I would say if I could pick one, one leader, that would be Norris Earl Francis. Uh, Norris Earl Francis was a football player, a quarterback, a leader on the field, a leader in the community. Uh, Francis has set a CAA record in his freshman year as a quarterback. Francis was an also an outstanding student. Uh, he was a, a campus leader, one of the greatest student leaders this campus has ever had. Um, Francis was, uh, was actually put on trial. So was his brother. Uh, so were uh, a, a couple of others, um, the Minga twins. They were, they were twins from New York. Um, and so they were, they were arrested. They were put on trial in the county before uh, Judge Chester Morris. And they were accused of trespassing. Now, the, the General Assembly had just changed the law regarding the punishment for trespassing prior in the previous months before. And now trespassing wasn't just something that included a small fine and maybe a, a short imprisonment. Mm -hmm. This could now talk about a massive fine and you know months, you know, and, and they were sentenced to around a year on the chain gang. Uh, now the, the bottom line here was the county, the the, the this court had no business even prosecuting this case because they, the students had already wanted us to be addressed in federal court. And in 1948, federal law gave them the right to do that and superseded any county. So, um, but they were uh, put before, uh, and ultimately were sentenced. And, and they did not serve time because the North Carolina Supreme Court overruled 
the district court's decision because of the federal law. The students had asked to be put before the federal courts and the county just said, no, we're going to do it. Hmm. Uh, it, To me, the county was making more of a statement. The county was mostly saying, we're going to do it our way. We're going to make an example of you. Uh, And of course, the local press, daily events uh, was supportive of the decision. They were supportive of the sentences that were laid down. And the students could have the students could have reacted in a way that was was threatening and, and and such. They didn't do that. They took the high road. They took the high road, uh, and, and they continued uh, the nonviolence. And, and and that that trend was to me the pervasive trend in both sixty and sixty three is that despite opposition, uh, despite opposition that really was illegitimate. Uh, and violated their rights, violated their civil rights, their human rights. Uh, they, they still persisted in doing, well, at least for personally, what I feel was, was was the right thing. And to me, that is a great point. Compared to, to 1948, the campus mm-hmm. had just grown so much. Uh, and, and Ridley, you see the influence of Ridley in that, to me, very firmly. Uh, now, they were, the students, as I recall from your article, their convictions were overturned, were they not? They were overturned by the North Carolina Supreme Court, correct. Mm-hmm. And, and it was a no-brainer because they this they had already asked to be have this addressed at the federal court, mm-hmm. and and such. So the Supreme Court just followed the law in that case. And but it said to me it was more of an example. It was more of a public statement that that the the powers that be wanted to send, and uh, mm-hmm. and and again, but they were overturned and they never served. They, they never served their sentences, but they did. They did spend time in jail uh, until they were bailed out. And by the way, speaking about um, some faculty members actually went downtown and bailed students out, took out their checkbooks, wrote out checks, bailed their students out. That was them making a statement to me. Uh, oh, yeah. To me, it's another point of pride. Faculty supporting students, faculty behind the students. I mean, people can voice their up. Uh, appraise all they want, but money talks, and they actually did their part to bail out these students. Mm-hmm. So, so you mentioned uh, the overturning of the convictions, and you mentioned yes. earlier also the uh, uh, the condescending and even hostile pub, uh, reporting from the uh, local yes. paper, the, uh, the Advance, the yes. Elizabeth City Advance. Sure. Did you have the a Advance, sense... Yes that I, I wanted to I wanted to talk about I wanted to have, have, have you talk a bit about the the coverage uh, uh, but let me just kind of add a, another so one question is can you know can you talk about the coverage of the uh, in the local press and how that might have shaped public opinion you know if you had a sense of how influential that was uh, to the residents of Elizabeth City but also did you have a feeling that after 63, so after 63, you mentioned in your article that, um, that, that by, ni- by, the, by the late 1960s, the press had, had changed its uh, attitude. Yes. But did you have a feeling that, say, the Supreme Court decision overturning those convictions perhaps chastened the, uh, both the government and, uh, and the press? But that, that's, I'll let that, you that, answer that, that however that, you want. Yes. There, uh, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There are many ways to answer that question. Uh, first thing, by, by local press, understand also that there, there was the local Daily Advance based in Elizabeth City. Uh, and, but there was another newspaper, the Norfolk Journal and Guide. That was a Black newspaper. It served Elizabeth City. And so you see actually there are many ways there were two local newspapers. One was the uh-huh. white newspaper and one was black. And there you Great. see the complete difference in coverage. Uh, the same was true in 1953. Uh, but in terms of 19, 1963, uh, the 1963 decision by the district court was praised and the Daily Vance called it a fine decision. That was there, it was a fine decision. Meanwhile, the Norfolk Journal and Guide they actually talked to the students and actually got a copy of a list of the student demands and reprinted the list of demands in the newspaper. 
So you have completely different ways of looking at it. One, one approach was dismissive of student concerns, dismissive of student rights. And then you have the Norfolk Journal Guide, which actually, not only did they not dismiss them, but they embraced them and supported them and actually gave them a voice. Did the, you might say, what, what changed the minds of the daily events? I said, I, I've, I've read the news, I've read the daily events of microfilm back, back from its inception. I'm literally day by day looking for things. Uh, and you see the change taking place, not really after 63, but you see it more in 64 and 65. Right. I think one of the reasons is that when you had the 1964 presidential election that elected uh, this basically super majorities of Democrats, that you start seeing the change in the Democratic Party and the Daily Vance was a Democratic Party newspaper. I think some of it was the understanding that um, Blacks are going to be voting and they were going to have to have their voice heard, like it or not. And I think, and also, as I noticed that the Daily Vance started to take a very firm stance against the, the white backlash to the civil rights movement and the, the, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, especially when it came to school desegregation. Uh, and you start seeing the change in the 66, 67, and then by 68, the Daily Advance is outright praising the, you know, the institution. Uh, and, and such, a, it's, it's a quite a transformation to me. And, and I have, I have actually have a database of, of every piece of news pertaining to African Americans from 1929 to 1969. And you, and I, you actually can track, if I ever had time to actually track the change uh, you know, what could write a paper on just how the newspaper, and it's probably true in other papers too. And, and I think what changed them is I think they started to appreciate and saw the humanity and saw the nonviolent approach by the students and then seeing how many ways uh, white reactionaries to civil rights employed violence. And they, and they start realizing that, wait a minute, there, there is a right side here. And, and the right side is <clears throat> the right side of the civil rights movement. And I and it just it's to me it's it's great to see how the newspaper was was willing to change and willing to evolve as they started to see how things uh, started to change. But you, and, and you look in between sixty three and sixty eight. That's only five years. That's only five right. years. Uh, and that that to me is just and it just shows just how successful the civil rights movement was, particularly an isolated, sometimes forgotten. Uh, afterthought compared to other cities in the state, Elizabeth City. Mm -hmm. Well, can we, let's kind of move ahead in time. Uh, you, your article ends on a very interesting note, uh, yeah. on a current note, which was that uh, yeah. uh, protests have been renewed in uh, Elizabeth City over the uh, uh, the killing of uh, Andrew Brown uh, Jr. And um, yeah. uh, I'm wondering, uh, can you talk about the, the protests and, um, and uh, you know, what things are like in Elizabeth City now? And uh, if you have some thoughts about the continuity that we talked about, that we spent the last bit of time talking about, uh, what is the same and what is different uh, in today's protests? That's, that, that's another complex question. Uh, sure. and, and I said, I'll answer it best because I, I, I kind of thought it was coming and I was kind of been planning, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? Because the continuity, uh, there was some continuity, but there's also some definite disconnect. Uh, what, one difference is that the Andrew Brown protest took place largely without student, Elizabeth City State student involvement. Hmm. What happened on campus here was that the Andrew Brown um, we call it killing, that's what it was. It took place right at the end of the semester and the university decided in order to protect the students, for the safety of the students, that we actually end the, ended the semester early. Uh, faculty were told to give uh, online um, examinations and such. So the student body for the most part had left because the, 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 you could just feel the tension and, and, and because it was just, it was just so horrifying to see. And then when you saw, I mean, it, it, it's troubling. I mean, it's troubling, it's still troubling to this day. Uh, and but one thing that I noticed in terms of the coverage, 
and I'm trying to find some, I'm trying to find some, find some positives here. The, the coverage, the news coverage was completely, completely different than it was during 60 and 63 in that we had press coming from all over the country and they were interested in the fight for justice here. They were interested in seeing the injustice here. Uh, and and you, you just, I, this town had, to me, I had never seen anything like this. Uh, just to give an example, but Spectrum TV, Spectrum News is associated with the cable channel. Uh, they came to Elizabeth City, did many stories, even contacted me to, for me to talk about my research that I'm sharing today. Uh, it's just the interest in civil rights, the interest in the fight for justice, the interest in this, as I said, sometimes forgotten town, uh, what was striking. And now in, in terms of the demonstrations, there is one great continuity is that to me, it's a point of pride that the protests here were like they were in 60, like they were in 63, like they were after the King assassination, peaceful. They, they, they were they were loving. There, there were there were there were times there were some other outside groups that came in that maybe did not express those thoughts as clearly as maybe they should. I would have liked them to, but the reality is, is that th these were nonviolent protests. And by the way, the protests, from my understanding, uh, there's still a handful of people who are still daily, daily protesting uh, because they want to see. From my understanding, they want to see. The tapes. The, I think one of the biggest issues remaining is where are the body cams so people can get a clear eye. Now again, I'm not a criminal justice person. I don't have any expertise in this. Maybe I'm not the person to interpret that. But uh, to me, that's a valid point. It is a valid mm -hmm. point, and the protests are still, from my understanding, it's why I think it's like day 295 or 296 now still going on because some people do want justice and to them justice uh i, I don't know how it's i don't know how elusive it's going to remain mm -hmm. uh, there are many answers there, there are many questions that i have as a citizen that i wish i had answers to uh, it, it it breaks it, it breaks my heart in many ways to see and you know there have been other incidents in this town since there were three people who were murdered right close to andrew brown was killed uh, mm -hmm. a matter of a few months ago. One of them was a toddler. A and it, it just breaks my heart because this is my, I mean, I was, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania. Uh, I have Quaker roots. This, but this is to me my home. This is to me my home. I raised my kids here. My daughter goes to school here at the university. This is my home. And it's just to see this place has meant so much to me, my family, torn apart like this. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's just, it, it's, it's just, um, it, it, it's sad, it's, it's tragic, and it, it's still, just as I said, it's, it's the stance, the last, it's not over yet, it's no, we don't have the answers yet, um, as historians, we can't look back now at this, because this is so close to us, hopefully one day, we will know more of a complete story, and maybe somebody else will one day write an article for the historical review that addresses this key incident in mm -hmm. Elizabeth City history. Well, I hope it reaches a conclusion soon and that you can uh, put your pen to paper and, uh, <laughs> and, and write that coda. Um, we're, we're out of time. Uh, this was very interesting to me. Um, and I thank you for uh, coming on to Flyleaf and uh, and uh, and sharing your your research, uh, and I'm glad that you thought about the uh, North Carolina Historical Review as a as an appropriate place uh, for this research. You your article is outstanding. I commend it to everybody who is watching, and um, it's a good reason why the North Carolina Historical Review is one of the outstanding state uh, uh, state historical. Uh, 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 scholarly publications in the country. So uh, thank you for coming on. My, my pleasure. And again, it's a pleasure. The historical review is a, a century of outstanding historical yeah. research. Mm -hmm. To me, it was the, to me, it was the place. It was the place I wanted to have it published. You're the only review that's ever seen that. 
is you and my first, you, you got first dibs on it, okay? So, because, because to me, it's where it needed to be. It needed to be. But thank you for having me. And I enjoy, I always enjoy talking about uh, ECSU history and, and other aspects of local history. It's the best part of my, it's the best part of my day, you know, talking yeah. about history. Oh, great. So, so thank you, okay. Professor Jake and, okay. and the staff. Thank you. Thank you. Possible. thank you. Professor Bowman, yes. All right. Thank you.